Hello, I'm Matthew Bay, a senior analyst at Stratfor, a Rain company. This podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, Rain's premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence analysis. Sign up for the free Stratfor newsletter at worldview.stratfor.com. You are listening to the Essential Geopolitics podcast from Stratfor, a Rain company. I'm Emily Donahue. We've entered another news cycle where the U.S. and other nations are evaluating strategic vulnerabilities with regards to raw material supply chains. One particular material that always seems to pop up is rare earth elements, and China controls the majority of the world's supply. For guidance on this matter, I turn to Rebecca Keller, Director of Analysis for Stratfor's geopolitical team. Hey, Rebecca. Hi, how you doing? I'm doing good. Why are rare earth elements important to the geopolitical strategies of major powers? Rare earth elements are vital to a number of different technologies. Um, They are vital to specific defense-related technologies, and they are becoming more and more important as we enter and continue in the nascent energy transition. They are vital to magnets in... Uh, wind turbines. They are vital to electric vehicles. They are in a lot of new emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, And they have properties because of where they sit on the periodic table and and, and their their elemental composition that make them very, very difficult to replace or substitute um, with something else. So when you want to use technologies that require rare earths, you don't really have a lot of choices other than rare earths. Well, I understand that China keeps threatening to limit exports. First of all, why would they do that? And and how viable is this as a policy? Yeah, um, China controls a a large majority of the rare earth processing capacity in the world. So rare earths, despite their name, are not actually rare. China only holds roughly a third of total known reserves. But because the, the process currently to extract rare earths from from rock, from the ground, is so caustic and potentially environmentally damaging. There aren't a lot of countries that want to host those facilities. And so, you know, in the second half of the 20th century, China really built up their capacity um, until they they had, you know, primary control of that market, which was, you know, fine for, you know, in general, as long as they kept exporting as needed, and other countries were other countries were able to to have what they need. You don't need a lot of rare earth elements. We're not talking about millions and millions of tons of materials. So it um, the problem is in, in 2010, China tried this for the first time. They banned rare earth exports to Japan, and that set off a lot of alarm bells that that really were already known when you have such a um, such a single point of failure in your supply chain. Um, And that started countries looking at the strategic vulnerabilities for this material that is so crucial to strategic technologies. However, strategic technologies like the defense sector make up a very, very small portion of where these rare earths are used. So they are used in all these strategic technologies, but they're also used in common things like ceramics. So when you look at the market overall and how you control pricing, it's really difficult to have a strategic driver. So all those words, what all those words mean is basically it's very difficult for the market to drive alternatives, that is to develop new mines elsewhere when there is enough material coming out of China. And this gives China a very powerful lever. They say, okay, we're going to threaten to cut off the supply of rare earths if you know the U.S. continues to exploit the trade deal or or something like that. Um, Just a hypothetical situation. But that lever is there. But the more more times that China uses that lever, um, the more and more times other countries, and and the US really is spearheading this in the West right now, are going to look for strategic alternatives. Now, the market may not push for um, alternative mining sites. But if you have strategic governmental support that is a way that we could see alternative sites come on and come online faster, even if the market doesn't demand it. So is this a viable solution? 
Yes, for now. Right now, China controls enough of the market that they can, and it is a powerful threat in the near term to cut off rare earth elements. But the more they make that threat, the more it's going to push other countries to determine strategic alternatives and make it less about the market and more about the, the geopolitical strategy of being able to maintain these technologies and the production of these emerging technologies. Well, what other countries would we expect to see rare earth mining expand? Right now, the key partnership that we're looking at is the one between US and Australia. Australia, back in 2010, was one of the places where we did see a small uptick in, in rare earth element mining as an alternative to China. You see processing in Malaysia. So I think um, looking at Australia as a potential alternative for the raw materials and also as a key strong strategic partner of the United States is going to see a lot of development and, and potential co-government support there. The other interesting location is Greenland, actually. Um, and as we look at the Arctic competition evolve, how China and the United States and Canada and Russia all position themselves in the Arctic, Greenland is going to be a key um, point of competition moving forward, and rare earth elements will play a role in, in that competition. Rebecca Keller is Director of Analysis for the Geopolitical Analysis Team at Stratfor, a rain company. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. You can stay up to date on the geopolitics of rare earth minerals with Stratfor Worldview. Sign up for our free newsletter. Details are at worldview.stratfor.com. That's worldview.stratfor.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening.